Today's episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter the offer code. What do you think the offer code is, Chris? Thumbs. It is correct. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, you got it. At checkout to get 10% off. Squarespace. It was so hard to not jump in and say, Toopy. Toilet. 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 Poop. <laughs> Doo-doo head. Enter the offer code feces. Oh, Enter the offer code feces. Reese's. <laughs> Feces, Reese's, feces. Reese's, feces. <laughs> Enter any combination of the words Reese's, feces, and feces and check out to be ejected from the store. Or species, too. Feces, species. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Sharon Stone and Reese's, species. <laughs> Thanks, Squarespace. It's <laughs> a really <laughs> strange ad. I don't know Pivot. what the service is for. It's August 19th, 2015. This is Idle Thumbs 224. I'm Chris Remo. I'm Sean Vanneman. I'm Jake Rodkin. And I'm James Spefford. Hi. Hey. Hello. Hello. Sean. Sean returns. Sean returns after three years. Of, <laughs> I, I, was, uh, quite, I was away for quite some time. Where have you been? I was at, well, I was just at a <laughs> wedding, but not the entire time of my departure. <laughs> oh. That would have been an incredible wedding. And it was an incredible <laughs> wedding <laughs> because it was my sister it's getting fine. married to a very nice boy. I'm happy to have him as a, as a, to uh, a I was going to say brother, but it was just so saccharine. I couldn't actually put, I couldn't get my mouth around it. The brother-in-law, right? Yeah. He's my brother-in-law, but my new brother. You know, when you like get too drunk at the, at, like the reception, sure. you're like, it's finally, finally got a brother. One of those moments. <laughs> nobody does that. Nobody did that two days ago or whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. I played Halo 2 there because my sister met her fiance playing Halo 2 at a party in college. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Was yeah. it okay? So, was the wedding, was this like an event where like. How many people were playing Halo 2 at once? Yeah, was it a lamb? No. Yeah, was this like just <laughs> do, 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 15 hopefully, rows of TVs I down wish. the aisle, hopefully bride the met- side versus groom side, <laughs> yes. red side versus blue yeah. side? Yeah, that's hopefully right. Hopefully they met during the Neil Diamond dance party that I also experienced in Halo 2 in college. Which you talked about on this very podcast. <laughs> yes, yeah. Google it and you'll find that story that Chris told. Yeah, uh... No, it was just one four on four situation because it was a destiny. It was a destination wedding at like a big cabin in Utah. And so in Halo. They couldn't. Wait, they uh, met playing Halo at a different wedding? No, they met playing Halo in college. <laughs> you at missed a the party. word. They met Halo. In, they, they met Halo. They, they met, met Halo. Halo. When Halo Good and. and God. <laughs> this is terrible. Halo no, they introduced met playing them. Halo at, the uni- at Chapman <laughs> University in Orange, California in like. 2006. So you got back into Halo 2 in honor of your new brother. No, I got into back into Halo 2 because it was there, and I went like, "Oh, I know how to." D- I can. Wait, how did they meet and playing Halo though? She went to a party. My uh, sister. Uh-huh. She left her her dorm, I assume. Yeah, yeah. And then she walked to a different location on campus. Oh, so it was co op. Correct. It was like in the well, same it was, room. It was, yeah, she was on fucking like team well, speak or whatever. What I thought was gonna <laughs> Being be like, crazy. fuck you, got you, Halo. He's like, oh, is this my future wife? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you. And then he the said a bunch of ethnic no, slurs. No, they and didn't sign on the internet. They okay. met at a party. Right. They met. They're not you that used uncool. to meet each other playing Halo, which is sitting next. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. This is yeah, yeah. This was, they okay. weren't. They were not on the internet at this time. Okay. And they were co-op, or was it? I think they were probably Death playing Deathmatch, for sure. But my sister, I think that was like that was her secret power, is that she is this sort of shy, like small brunette, and she sits down and was able to like whoop people's asses in Halo too, because her and I played a lot of like single screen multiplayer shooters growing up. 
and uh and I left all my video games at my in my room that she moved into when I left <laughs> to go to college. And then I was had to sleep in her room full of girly stuff uh, for years when I would come home for Christmas. But she was she's very good at video games. And video games is sort of I don't know, this is sort of interesting, I guess, in that I went to this wedding where everyone there was really into video games. Huh. Whereas I am into Not video games, into but I work games. in the industry, so I sort of like keep it like over there and then everybody there was really into video games they knew about like firewatch and like anything i'd ever worked on which is really cool and they talked about video games like friends and fans of games and it was really cool to like see that in like amongst people i like were in my like i was in that this for three days in a social circle of people who were just like unabashedly enthusiastic about Triple A games. Mm. Unlike was, anyone in the games industry. <laughs> <laughs> unlike any, yeah, you know, unlike like anyone in beaten yeah. down. Yeah. And that was really invisible. it was really it was fun to just like play multiplayer video games on a screen in celebration of like something that was just well, were you playing like, whilst like, they were getting married? Was that you know, like interrupting them? Yeah, we were screaming. doing that. Yeah, we were, they, that's exactly how we were doing it. We actually um, made a machinima of the entire wedding in Halo <laughs> 2, and then we watched it, and that's how they got married. That's, that, is, that is almost certainly a thing that has happened. Mm-hmm. Someone has yeah, been married I mean, inside of Halo, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. I mean, so you can kneel, lots, right? Or you I can bet, at least propose. I bet lots of people have been married inside World of Warcraft. That's true. Someone's oh, yeah, probably been have. proposed to yeah. in definitely in... Yeah. in Wow, but probably in Halo as well, given that you can crouch. Yeah. Easy peasy. I want to see someone do it. I want to see someone like, I don't know how you would do this. I guess you just have to put out a call on on extended social media and just get sort of pseudo anecdotal data. I want to see someone rank like from start like number one being the most games with most number of marriages performed inside of them. In, performed inside. Yeah. So, like, World of Warcraft and Second Life, almost certainly. World of Warcraft, top, clearly, top clearly the winner. Yeah. Yeah. World of Warcraft, yeah. Pro, oh, yeah, definitely the winner. Second Life up there. Eve, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Marriage and Eve. Sorry. <laughs> That's Good. the best. <laughs> that would last. That would last. Those are two very, yeah. like, detail oriented. EverQuest, people. definitely. Ultima Online, almost certainly. There was an article on, off, any on, on, uh, on Offworld. The Boing Boing game site that Lee Alexander mm-hmm. uh, runs that was about how remember in in like the in the first decade of the 2000s Second Life was big and universities were all really excited about running mm. distance learning courses in Second yeah, Life. Yeah, 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 I read this. This is so good. And like so one of the sort of Scandinavian or Nordic countries opened like an embassy inside of Second yeah, Life. Yeah, I guess some of the islands that contain those universities have still are just they exist but are not maintained so there's now just a, but and some of them were built to look like university campuses so now there are just actual abandoned structures of full universities oh, that you can man. wander in second life but the, the article also pointed out that some of them like to make it fun like also built a pirate ship that you could go to a class in <laughs> so you can wander the, the like the skeletal remains of an abandoned university in second life and then also engage in an automatic distance learning course that's like taught via <laughs> oh, wow. weird scripts uh, I guess or like you get the base Basic reading material yeah. for some uh-huh. classes in this in this stupid abandoned university that then has a pirate ship floating around and then just a it. weird airborne fleet of dildos walking. <laughs> yeah, around. exactly. That a guy in a dragon mask tries to fuck you, yeah. uh, and somehow you have no money. This is uh, how people in the future will learn about long lost like <laughs> things that people this have like what, long forgotten. Like what I is love this? That, like yeah, we, in whoa. the early twenty first century, many college courses <laughs> so, were taught in unusual virtual it's worlds. So good. <laughs> Look at the Second Life, the sort of rise and fall of Second Life gave us the shitty VR cyberspace that we all hoped yeah. would exist and then be immediately abandoned at the dawn of the 21st century. Like, you could wander yeah. a stupid abandoned university. Yeah. Oh, it's anyway. So, and get married in it, I guess, if mm-hmm. you want. You get married in the remains of some, like, yep. local state university that had a Second Life program for two I, years. I like that Second Life, even when it was totally current and new, was already. Like just in its heyday, it was all it was like a complete. It was already a ruin of itself. Like things would instantly become ruined versions of themselves because yeah, there some was guy no would just cohesive. march through with his fucking crazy like dragon made out of bananas and like you know poop dwarves. Like just always. Crazy. I wouldn't say that was ruining anything. <laughs> 
it's improvement. It was ruining any chance of Second Life had of being anything other than what Second Life was. Yeah, the, the reason that it was so notable is because that stuff was happening simultaneously when it was also the subject of the highest expectations of, like, serious sort of governmental and educational ambition and, like, cultural permanence and all these things. All, it had all, all people were trying to, like, layer onto it all of these very lofty goals and but it was also just the most ruined shitty like hilarious canvas for troll dorks like from square one so it was just always like a quixotic affair and that was why it was good (laughs) (laughs) anyway my sister's wedding was really good unlike (laughs) anything that would have happened in second life (laughs) right I'm glad it happened in this life. Yeah. Our first life, as we call it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Good. I was just trying to look this stuff up to see if I could find any coverage of Second Life in the political space. And the the first thing that I found is an article in Wired by Susan Arndt. And the headline is just, Presidential Hopefuls Doubt Usefulness of Campaigning in Second Life. <laughs> <laughs> it has a picture of a really shitty low-res uh, like TV studio set that says John Edwards 08 on it. Which... <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. They were proven wrong. Well, oh, man. I mean, look. That Edwards campaign was prescient. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Man, so talking about um, Sean's recent experience and its relation to video games actually reminds me of, I guess, here's a segue to the next thing we can talk about, I suppose, <laughs> which is that, Spaff, you have been gone for a while also in part because you've been moving mm-hmm. to a new house in which I assume you're assembling furniture. <laughs> Yes. Uh, before this podcast began, you and I were cooperatively and poorly assembling furniture, furniture in a game called Home Improvisation, mm-hmm. which I'd never even heard of. How did you? What? It, uh, well, yeah, because I've been moving house for it feels like weeks now, and just assembling. For, I've been to IKEA like four fucking times. Yeah, because we only have a small car, so you can only get so much in there. But then mm-hmm. it's like home. I'm just assembling furniture. Uh, and I was going to come back on the cast. I was like, oh, shit, I haven't played any video games in ages. Um, and I was just kind of looking on Humble Bundle today, like Humble thing. And I saw this Ikea-looking game. And I was like, mm-hmm. I'm going to play that. <laughs> this is a terrible experience I'm, gonna I'm be having. Super it's something good that I should it. recreate. Yeah, I'm going to be super good at it. I'm going to know exactly what you do. Um, so Home Improvisation is a physics-based furniture assembly game. Uh, it's basically to Ikea-style furniture assemblage what surgeon simulator is to surgery yeah i I was gonna say like octodad like it's just this fumbling useless world like you can see how this these four legs have to go into this table but can you rotate them into the correct fucking way to actually what happens is you go into a room your dining room or your living room your bedroom i guess uh there's a basement basement right uh and it you are delivered a piece of furniture and the box just like opens up and it just has all of the pieces of furniture in it and there are no instructions <laughs> yeah. or anything. The only like, like, like thing that you know how what it looks like is on the box is a picture of it. Right. And, and as I, soon as you click on it, it goes cha- away. Yeah, when, <laughs> <laughs> That's gone. So when, my first, when my first chair like opened up, I hadn't even, I, it didn't even occur to me that I needed to look at the picture first because I didn't know what I was doing. And it opened up and I had just, I was instantly paralyzed. <laughs> like it was, I felt so, it, it was such a terrible, just instant, um, kind of it summoned me instantly to that state of already being halfway through the Ikea thing and realizing that you've fucked something up and it's with one of those pegs that you put in and it never comes out again. <laughs> and now you're screwed forever and you're just in hell. And, and I, and I just in this game just put me in that without any warning before I even knew what was going on. And it was really fun that for a long time, we didn't know that you could unconnect. Yes. Things. <laughs> So it's just like, oh, that's connected and to I that kind bit of wish forever that you, now. I kind of wish that you you can't. Yeah. Because I had this experience recently where I was I bought um it wasn't actually IKEA, but it was the, the same exact kind of thing. It was just a thing from Target. It was um like a shelving unit that was uh, you know, sort of one of those like two by three grids of cubes. And it was a, it was you had to basically assemble it all precariously and keep all the things propped up so that they could all be like pe- pegged together at the same time. And if any of them fell over, you couldn't attach any of them. So it's like, Oh God. And I remember rotating the whole thing 90 degrees and just hearing that just 
horrible crunch and snap of just <laughs> shitty, shitty plywood, which has no integrity whatsoever. And it was just one little piece that snapped and I'm like, welp, this entire thing is fucked now. <laughs> like, the entire thing is now garbage. Like it's all worthless because the one piece that connects the middle of the shelf that ever all the other shelves go on is now gone. And I have this huge cube of useless, <laughs> not actual wood in my room. And it's just a big piece of shit that I just spent $60 on. I mean, of course, I only spent $60 because it's literally garbage. It's actually like <laughs> garbage packed inside of more garbage that they then like put laminate on and sell it to you. And you just buy like a box of garbage and you pretend that it's furniture until it breaks. And then you realize, oops, it was actually garbage all along. It was always garbage. This is the garbage pinata. In yeah. There. If yeah. you're going to buy the crappy peg furniture, you should always at least buy it from Ikea because the garbage is slightly more glued together than the Target yeah, I'm one. I'm sure it's, I'm sure that I bought the even shittier garbage. Like the Target one, you know, it's, it's worse because you open it up and like just dust and newspapers come like just <laughs> pouring out of the box yeah and at God. least at least ikea doesn't have the dust yeah. and if newspapers. you buy something from ikea you can go there and go look i fucked buy the it parts, i fucked it and they're yeah. like of course you did there's a giant bin of parts yeah, right yeah, there yeah, yeah. where if you take it back to target they're just gonna say why did you buy this i know <laughs> this well, so silly. the why did this you is buy seriously this? people think we have a furniture section like yeah. that's Ugh, why did you buy this is basically what was told to me by a moving company when I moved across the coast and tried to ship my IKEA furniture with them, and they were like, "Well, we don't do this." <laughs> I'm like, "Well, they're like, we don't. We're not going to put this in our truck. It's just going to. It's all going to be in pieces on the other side, and you're going to blame <laughs> us, and we we can't do anything. It's trash." <laughs> like, this is all I have in my apartment, and he's like, "Well, you're not going to have. You need a way much. better life." Like, yeah. <laughs> And then Your I, life and is I, so bad. Yeah, I know. And, and then I shipped, I shipped the desk, and it got, and it was exactly what the guy said. It got to the other side, and it was my entire desk was literally just two pieces. It was just snapped the entire way through the middle. It was like cartoon, like a cartoon snap desk with like the little you know jagged bits like pointing at each other. And so he basically said, "You can afford to pay a moving van to move all of your belongings." <laughs> well, it was on a relocation budget. So I mean, I, I oh, okay. it's hard to sort of like figure out how you're going to game yeah, that because it's yeah. like, look, if we amortize your your moving, this moving this desk is going to cost you a hundred dollars, and this desk is worth five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just don't. Mm -hmm. You're better off just the, showing the up. The one with exception a to that is that I have a Billy bookcase from Ikea that has now gone across the country with me twice. It went from San Francisco to Boston and then from Boston back to San Francisco and it's still there. Well, it's, it's a, a Billy bookcase. That's, Billy like, the book, most, that's like the most generic Ikea. Mm -hmm. Like just straight up it's a box that you put your books yeah. into. Okay. Like, it's yeah. just a book and the, Billy the, bookcase sounds like a like a Hardy Boys. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the backing of it which is hilarious which is cardboard with laminate on it to make it look like more wood. It's actual actual cardboard yeah, of that is taped together yeah. with actual tape. That's how they, they that's not how you repair it. That's how they give it to you. Um, that part's all torn up and bad, but the actual bookcase still stands. So I'm, I'm that's the Billy that's line is by. tough line. It's resilient. Yeah, it's good, good line. Anyway, there's this video game called. <laughs> did you Did you guys actually talk about the fact that it is multi multiplayer yes, same screen? It's, it's up to four. Yeah, it's up to four players same screen co-op. Four player. Yeah, well, and so well. you you and I were playing, and you, and each player gets. You're all in the same room together with all the same furniture and stuff, and each of you just has one cursor, and you can each just pick up the different pieces and put them all together. And it sort of like has snapping, you know, if a peg is near a hole, you know, a peg of like a leg of a desk is near a hole of the surface of the desk or of any other piece of furniture or anything. Yeah. Right. And anything that's remotely compatible can be linked yes. together. Yeah, connection right? points are universal yeah. mm -hmm. on all the different parts. And it kind you of... You guys are really smart. Sorry, go ahead. It kind of aligns it, but it doesn't align it properly. So it'll like put it in a realistic angle for the peg, but then your chair leg will be like... 80 yeah, it's up to, it's up to you. Right. Backwards. It'll it'll connect it. Right. It'll it'll put it on the right axis for the actual like direction the joint is facing. Right. The yeah. peg goes into the hole, but you can spin it around inside of there every direction because right. it's a peg. It'll always be flush, but exactly. it doesn't mean that like the table top isn't going to be twenty <laughs> <Right>. degrees. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> what I really love way. is that <laughs> the pretense of this game is that you're trying to make a nice living room. <laughs> right. Like when you you you're given a living room and it already has a couch and. A vase oh, I thought you made vase. that. No, I was that so was already impressed there. by your living room. And there was a cat. There's a cat in it for some reason. 
Uh, and it's then like you have all these tools. Cabinet. You can like paint the walls mm-hmm. and paint. The, you know, you can try and make. No, you can like dim the lights and build a light and make nice lighting. Yeah. But all your furniture just looks like hell, <laughs> like <laughs> chaos. <laughs> so good. Yeah. You guys were very smart in that. I feel like if I was trying to do this task in real life cooperatively, my partner and I would attempt to assemble the same table together, and then that would end in a fight, <laughs> or at worse. <laughs> Whereas you guys just sort of got your two pieces of furniture delivered, like, and then went to other sides of the room and built your own things. And then and we combined them. Kind of yeah, came together in certain moments. But that was much smarter, I think. Well, Chris was really smart because he took a piece of a, a chair that was a big flat thing. He was like, how do I assemble this? And he lifted it up, put it on the table Yeah, to then put stuff on it. Yeah. Well, I was done. very pleased with myself for that. I felt It felt like a tiny little bit of sort of adulthood. <laughs> Real yeah. realism. Yeah. Yeah. That game is so funny. this game is on the Humble Store. Yeah, it's is it elsewhere? Steam. I think it was on in Green um, early. I don't know if it's still early access or not. I'm not sure. And it's called Home Improvisation. Yeah, it's very very dumb. In married life, this will replace uh, Halo Two for your sister and her new husband. They're probably doing <laughs> it right now. They're probably playing this game right now. Yeah, I hope so. Oh, before we just leave that, you can make new pieces of furniture and then put them on the oh, Steam yeah. Workshop. <laughs> People That's can, incredible. I guess, order them and try and build yeah. them or just put them in their house. I don't know. I haven't tested that fully. Hopefully you can b- make furniture that people can order and then ruin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course you can. I mean, oh, yeah. Really I imagine there's, no way to pre- there's no way to prevent you from ruining things. What was that table called? Bork? There was a Bork. Yeah. They have good, good, hilarious, <laughs> good you know, names. That's that one's like most of them Dirk. are more subtle than than Bork. But uh, <laughs> they're just like vague sounding European yep. Scandinavianish names. Anyway, it's a funny, weird game. I've been trying to order some chairs from IKEA that they haven't had in stock, but they're named really in these is for stupid reasons. It's because they're called Idolf. <laughs> <laughs> Such a stupid. If you're trying thing to, to order something from IKEA that is, they don't, they don't have. <laughs> Do you you're have never getting them. No, that's why you're sitting on a squid right now. <laughs> Oh, that's Jake's, true. Jake's mom had to make that cover because Ikea sent us that couch without a cover. Or at least, uh, without half of a cover. Oh, and they were like, oh, we don't have the other part. It doesn't, it's not made anymore. No, yeah. sorry. So J- Jake's make mom a squid version. Well, it's What's the Swedish now? word for no? We don't yeah. have it. Norp. Norp? <laughs> I don't know what it is. Oh, God. Good. Good news. My friends are going to complain because I said the word vase back then instead of vase. Vase. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's you already want, started. You posh enough? Yeah. Your transformation has already enough. begun. Yeah. Every bite of it's Taco complete. Bell makes you a little bit more American. <laughs> <laughs> and sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I also played a game that is based on like a actual real... Fucking Segmaster over here. ...activity, although a much straighter <laughs> take on it. Um, I found this by just doing a thing that I, I haven't really done as much recently. The other over the weekend, I was just kind of browsing through Steam new releases, um, which is kind of nice. It's it's it got really difficult to do for a while because Steam, the sort of pipe you know of just new Steam games, mm-hmm. got so just full that the new release list was almost useless. I mean, there'd be weird like graphics software and like dlc and just all kinds oh of is, it, is it curated to your taste well now? now they have new releases and popular new releases and popular new releases is just a pretty it's it seems like a pretty um low threshold just like this this is something that might be vaguely interesting if you actually play video games you know what yeah. i mean it's a good it seems like a good filtering mechanism it seems like the time window on that is narrow enough to where it's not something that's like been out for two months it's still popular new release yeah, like it'd be it doesn't a blockbuster feel, yeah, or it doesn't something fe- it doesn't feel like yeah. it's trying to like optimize for big triple a things it's no, just not at all. generally speaking like here's just a pared down feed of new stuff that's coming out that if you actually play video games as opposed to just want to see every single thing on the steam store um it's useful anyway so i was looking through that and i saw a game called hacknet and i didn't know anything about it i just i just got it bought it downloaded and played it and it's really crazy. It is a oh, I saw this game. Oh, is really? This an actual term? You actually yes, are it's hacking. An, it's a, a whole game. Yeah, is a is a terminal. It yeah. has it has like graphical elements of it. But the 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 conceit is that you are a hacker and you are hacking into like other terminals just on the internet, and you you know connect to IP addresses and like 
connect to ports on those servers and like overload them and Sweet. root around the file structure and like delete files or download files and snoop around. And then you have to, and you sort of in the game that you play through kind of a tutorial and then you end up, um, you get, you're getting email messages from, you know, a mysterious, like a program, I guess that, that someone who was like, I'm not sure killed or captured or something like set up to sort of guide you. And then you end up, um, becoming part of this, like, self-described like you know uh, kind of justice oriented hacker collective and end up doing tasks from them in the way that you would like do tasks from an adventuring board in an, in a fantasy rpg you know you take these like hacking contracts and uh you know investigate corporations and, and individual people and stuff like that uh the, but it, the thing that's crazy about it is that they it's really they pick they they nail a really good point on the spectrum of being doable you know if you're not an actual person who's ever like hacked into things which i I certainly have never done um but also (laughs) yeah (laughs) but also really feeling like you're doing the thing like i very frequently would forget like what is the actual command for like this fourth step of like hacking into a thing and then i would would have to consult you know the the notes or the guide or whatever and your hacker's handbook Yeah, yeah the big red linux book or whatever Remember Hackers? Were they going on about the books? I never saw that. <laughs> oh, no? You don't remember that movie? Okay. Chris didn't need to see these. lived it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, really, it's really cool. I got really into it. I played it for, for a while, actually. I played it for several hours. And it's narrative-driven. It looked like like it was like you're trying to figure out what happened to somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the thing that was – one of the things – so we talked about – we did a, a you know spoiler cast about her story, the, the – FMV game, her story, and if you um, didn't, if you didn't hear that, and you finished the game, and you'd like to hear our thoughts about it, it was released on the feed a week or two ago, I guess, on just on the this normal Idle Thumbs RSS feed. And um, it one of the things we we talked about with 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 respect to that game was how we all appreciated how much it really respected the player to just directly uh, interact with this like underlying system, which in that game was, you know, this police database of uh, interview videos and just, it just lets you do it. And you just keep searching for things and parsing videos and taking notes and searching for new things and, and like thinking back to your memories of other things you've watched. And this game is like that to an even crazier degree where, you know, the game just doesn't progress unless you uh, do what you're supposed to do to, to hack into these machines. And after you get through the basic tutorial, you it really starts feeling like you're actually doing stuff for real. It's it's really crazy, and whereas a game like Her Story rewards um, kind of media literacy and like the ability to sort of identify tropes in a very light way, but then also just kind of use your your intuition about story and like crime procedurals and so on to like help you piece together what's going on. Um, this game Hacknet rewards, I guess, just sort of growing up with computers and just having a basic level facility for using a command prompt and like navigating DOS directories. And like, you don't need to have done that to play the game because it tutorializes you. But definitely if you have any experience in your life of just interacting with computers in a text based way, you really feel like, oh man, that stupid worthless knowledge. You know, it's not worth <laughs> knowledge if you're like actually a server admin in real life. But if you're not, if you're just like a person who just happened to like play DOS games as a kid, um, you really are like, oh man, I am fucking nailing this to the wall because I can type, you know, CD space <laughs> and then the folder name and I go into that folder and then I well, can look like at what's in it. Well, that's like quadrilateral cowboy has that same feeling of just your basic knowledge of a command line directory yeah. structure and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's, I, uh, it's really cool. Hearing about this, I have, I have a question for you, yes. Chris. What are the chances that the actions that you were taking in the game are, in fact, real? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, I mean, what if this is like some sort of crowdsourced? Are you or are you not a new member of Lizard Squad in your <laughs> face, bro? <laughs> oh, man. Spe- okay. Speaking of that, there's one thing that is that I. Good. Speak, speak of whatever that was. You have my attention. There's, there's one thing about the game that I'm like kind of conflicted about which is how, there's so, so you know a lot of what you're doing is you're you're rooting through 
um, files in on other computers. And, uh, you know, like like any game that's about hacking, they they fudge how people actually store stuff on their computers. You know, like there are just fol- like folders just only, you know, three levels deep or so from the like root drive that just have just like IRC chat logs and, you know, like emails that are just there and like, okay, well, whatever, it's fine. Like it, that's not how a computer really is organized, but it doesn't really make any difference. The way that you used to actually store things when you had direct control of your C drive in DOS, but has not, but has not been the way anyone has stored anything for ever. It's how your mom stores everything. That's true. They're all everything just saved to my (laughs) users. Or your mom stores her IRC chat logs. Yeah. Um, Yeah, My mom stores her IRC chat logs. Hold on. I don't want to imply that that's the thing I'm conflicted about because that's not what I meant. Uh, (laughs) Why are you so upset about this directory structure? That's totally fine. The thing that I'm conflicted about is how much of the sort of, humor that is uncovered in some of those chat logs is just completely like late nineties and early to mid two thousands kind of adolescent male computer dork style humor. That's just kind of like cringe inducing. And I, 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 it's really difficult to identify if that's like the, the point or if it's, or if it's just so much what the author of the game right. like knows that it's like, just... Are you the FBI agent who's wandered into this world going, oh, okay, these fucking kids. Right. Or are you one of these right. kids and, and we're I think, all talking And I like think probably together. in reality, it's that the author intends it as the former, but it's also kind of really the latter. You know, you know what right. I mean? Do you know what I mean? The like, shoe fits a little too, yeah, yeah, yeah. too snugly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, I, I don't know. It doesn't... It doesn't it's not the end of the world, but like it, and I, part of, I guess what's funny about it is I just remember so much that culture from being, you know, I was never like in, I, I never actually like learned anything about hacking or really spent time on like where's forums or like whatever it was that, Lame. but like, but if you were into com- PC gaming, probably in where's forums, the late night, I don't know, like what, it just wherever those people, IRC channels, I guess, um, if you were into PC gaming, at a certain time you were just super aware mm-hmm. of that language and that culture. And like, it was weird to see it in a game released in 2015. Maybe that stuff is still around. I don't really know. Anyway, uh, ultimately I, I, I found this game really, really cool and really impressive. And, um, I, I liked it a lot. It's called Hacknet. One word. Yes. I got it on steam, but I'm sure it's probably available elsewhere. I would think <laughs> it's definitely only on PC. I would be confident of that. Yeah. Hacknet only on PC. <laughs> Linux. It's, I mean, it's yeah. Probably, it better be on Linux by PC. Probably not just Windows. Maybe though. I, I don't suck at Apple peasants. Yeah, it, it came from it, it started off as a Linux peasants. game. <laughs> well, the when you to to look at a directory, you type ls rather than dir, and that's a Linux thing, right? Or a Unix? Yeah, thing. that's a Unix thing yeah. and a Mac thing. That's well, a Unix. Linux, that's Unix, a Unix yeah. based, not Windows. So. Yeah. Hmm. Microsoft peasant, <laughs> but there's but there's also like exe- executable files exes. So, so it's kind confusing. of like a mix of it's sort of a jumble. So it's like so it's fake. Us. So it's not even <laughs> what, a, what? Why not just oh, install Linux? One, one thing. Sorry. One thing to say about this game. Um, th- this happens early on, or it can happen early on anyway. I think, but there's a uh, I, I I experienced a blue screen at one point in the game. And I had a, I basically had a fucking heart attack. Like in the, you know, fictionally in the game, like your computer is the, you know, hard reboots with the blue screen and everything. And all this stuff is made to look very convincing and, and very real. And it was a really good, like really good effect. Very, very well done. All that stuff in this game is really, is really convincing and really like works to make it feel like you're actually navigating these networks and, and like, doing things it's not it's it's obviously played up in that they make all of the security breaching stuff way easier than it obviously is in life but it it's just on the right side of that to make to make it not feel like sort of um it like insulting or you know were you about the happiest person in the world in fez when you got the fez and the world went from 2d to 3d and it it pretends to just crash your computer and puts a new post screen up and Mm, reboots yeah yeah. Uh that was the best thing ever oh it was great that's all yeah that's all i have to say about fake computer crashes fez had the best one yeah. does windows still have a blue screen of death windows 10 
Yeah. Does anyone know? I, think I don't know about Windows 10. Windows 7. In Windows, Windows 7 still, when something incredibly hardcore happens, yeah. it just gives you the classic blue. It's a lot blue. more rare than it used to, but it, but when it happens, it's still blue. I wonder if they still just kept it in just for fun. Or just for they, fun? Yeah, like, I don't <laughs> know. Users, it's kind of a, users demand this I think it's thing. kind of a heritage thing. <laughs> at, a, at a certain point, the crash oh, has yeah. to just be so hard that it dumps back the text. I mean, when OS 10 kernel panics, the same thing happens. You have that beautiful OS 10 screen in the background, and then just like... Unix command line text writes like five or six lines of black text in the top corner of the screen, and you're fucked. Like, that's it. You just get to take a photo of this with your iPhone if you want to tell someone what happened, because it just, yeah. yeah. When the text terminal has to draw over the top of your computer, you're yeah. sad. I just wonder if they see it as like. The number of people that post blue screen of death on like an ATM or the. They would the be airport, so. Like, like screens, if, whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, people are like, ho, ho, ho. I wonder if they're like <laughs> embracing it <laughs> or they're like, get rid of that fucking thing. That seems like the kind of thing that Microsoft or like a Microsoft contracted ad agency would try to own yeah. in an advertising campaign because they've made such a big deal about uh, their new, you know, newer versions of Internet Explorer, which apparently are actually getting a lot better. But I it remember they had a campaign anymore. where they're like, they had this whole campaign of like, IE sucks or something. And like, that was the campaign of like, them acknowledging like we know how much web developers hate internet explorer so they just like had a hashtag that was that and so on and like the point of it was to be like try the new version of this it's actually good i think starting in <laughs> windows 8 they Success. did they did actually <laughs> change the blue screen of death to be a more friendly one because the windows 8 one i think actually has a like frown emoji on they it. Tried to make it more friendly. They tried to make it more friendly. Now it's a frown. Now it's a grimacing well, it's like, Now it's Steve aware Ballmer. that it's something bad has happened. Do you have a big feel. middle finger? Do you remember, do you remember uh, <laughs> on, like, on old Macintoshes, on pre-OS 10 Macs, if something went wrong, it would just sort of go and show a picture, yeah, like an well, icon like, of the little happy guy. Mac with like X eyes. Oh, crumply yeah. sad guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it would just go like a weird like, sad chime. Game and it was over. Just, like, yeah, I just owned. Like, it's so sad. He's, he's they were doing now. that like all the way up to like OS nine. Yeah, OS nine. The little sad guy oh, was there. I fucking hate that guy. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa! What did he ever do to you? Killed your dad. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a new job in Windows now, probably. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You guys want to take a break? Breaky, sure. breaky. I thought of something to ask you guys about. In the break, I don't know. Video game. Hey, Spath. I have a question. It's going to be a tough one, isn't it? Do you know the feeling of putting on old saggy underwear? Yes oh, or no? man, yeah. The worst ones. The ones with, like, holes in, and you're like, oh, these are the only ones I have because all the other ones are dirty. I don't have to wear them anyway. And they're all loose. That sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> Way worse than I thought. Yeah. yeah, I was prepared for just, like, the oh, yeah, that's not good. all gone. A stained bag. A, a <laughs> loincloth. <laughs> you need MeUndies.com. Oh. Do you know about MeUndies? MeUndies are actually really great. I have a few pairs of MeUndies. They're uh, just really well-made, two times softer than cotton, they say, underpants that you can get at MeUndies.com. But if you go to MeUndies.com slash thumbs, you can get 20% off your first order and free shipping and they have lots of styles and colors that you would like because I see the clothes that you wear every day. And it's always very stylish <laughs> and I patterned and colored. In my yes. Yeah, I see you here and I think about what pattern of me undies would Spath be wearing if he was wearing them. Right now he'd probably be wearing ones with little mustaches on them, maybe. Or like ones with polka dots. Or like a Navajo print or some sort of similar. <laughs> I'm down with all of those designs. Yeah, I think How they would all suit them? you. You're probably you meundies.com slash thumbs, twenty percent off free shipping. Also, not just for dudes. They have a women's collection. They have a new four-piece line of undies designed specifically for the female body. Anyways, it's me undies, me undies dot com slash thumbs. Thanks, me undies. Video game. James Spafford. Yo, what was your favorite television show growing up? Um, I can't think of anything except Quantum Leap. So Don't you wish there that. was a great Quantum Leap website? Actually, yes, that would be good. You could probably make a great website about should. Quantum Leap yeah, with Squarespace. Well, how would that help me make a really good Quantum Leap website? Well, first off, it's fast and easy. Okay. You can go to squarespace.com and use the promo code THUMBS to get 10% off your first order. Websites are 8 bucks a month. You buy a year. Guess what? You can get Spaff's Quantum Leap hole.com. <laughs> <laughs> you can get a free uh, domain name if you buy a year. 
but it's going to be formatted for all devices you could even imagine. It's going to look beautiful, very, very uh, simple to set up. You could set up your blog with Quantum Leap news and places you wish you could jump. You could set up a store to sell bootleg illegal Quantum Leap merchandise. Could I set up a guest book so that um, different traveling versions of Sam Beckett could sign in as different people? I think that's probably pretty their names. Yeah, hey, I'm nice. this woman. You can, you can at least leave comments uh, on on your hypothetical ones and say been there, haven't been there. Cool. They have really nice Google Apps integration though, so it could be like he could log into something and it would post to a Google Doc for you, so you could get those notes personally or whatever. Yeah, hook it up to lots Google of different Google stuff to form. Get yeah. How was your latest jump? I, this is a strange quantum you could have, leap website. You could have this images. You could have I'm art. You could have your fan art, your OCs, your <laughs> quantum leap OCs. I have a lot of In a nice gallery. Fan art, so it would look really that. nice. You're going to go to squarespace.com and use the promo code THUMBS. Because it's going to get you a discount. And then the Squarespace folks are going to know that you heard about it from get, us. Get it for a year and you can get askziggy.computer for free. <laughs> Squarespace. Video game. Idle Thumbs old, like 2004 era Idle Thumbs used to talk about Ziggy the hologram like all the fucking yeah, time. True. Or Al the hologram and Ziggy the computer. Al the for fucking some, hologram. For some <laughs> fucking reason, Quantum Leap was mentioned a thousand times yeah. on that webpage. You know, one of my favorite things about Quantum Leap is random. On the Wikipedia somewhere, I don't know if it still exists, Future History Timeline. And it's a t- it begins in, I think, 1990 or something. And then it goes all the way to 20XX. And it has like all like... I think it's like 1992, whatever, the Terminator happens. And that kind of, this kind of begins oh, okay, around there. Yeah. And then it's all the like fictional, like, you know, it has it goes into the distant future and has like Daleks destroy the Earth, or whatever. But one of them has 1997, Sam steps into the Quantum Leap Accelerator <laughs> and vanishes. <laughs> I like that. I remember when that happened. Yeah. In 1997. That was the future, though, when that series was out. Maybe it still is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I played a game called Contradiction. We're back. All right, we're back. Yes, we're Contradiction, back. what is back. that? Um, Contradiction is a f- an FMV detective adventure game that is meant to be like the classic FMV games like of the 90s. Tex Murphy or whatever? Like uh, Seventh Guest or oh, okay. mm. that kind of thing. Like full like recorded actors, different camera angles, different exterior shots cheesy kind of cgi stuff. sets e, if it's not called quite. contradiction is like the dick in diction like pulled out as a <laughs> no i wish it was oh so <laughs> why why would you think that would be true? like a private dick yeah oh but it's set, like the, dicks the thing is though it's, <laughs> set in, it's set in england it's set in a little sleepy village in surrey or sussex maybe which is kind of south england where, where i'm from so that's why i recognize the stupidity of it um, someone has been murdered and oh heavens there's a very small cast of people in this local village and they send the most implausible detective in the universe to go and investigate it further on his own <laughs> he <laughs> he has a full wide brimmed hat like a really bizarre hat and he's just so overacting joyous that he is on the case of this. Is this intended this to be a self-aware FMV yeah, game? This, so or is playing it just bad? this, I didn't quite know if it's supposed to be. I think it, I think the person who made it, um, had aspirations to make a, I'm not sure if they believe it's the first fully acted adventure game with a full cast of people. And they did a Kickstarter and it was successful and they've made it. Um, and playing it, uh, <laughs> it really feels like there's old, FMV games for better or for worse in that it just doesn't really make sense half the time and the UI is really awful and controlling it. It's, it's bef- like from that era before anyone really thought about how you should navigate menus probably right. and which yeah. buttons should do the right thing. Um, I looked it up. It's, it's actually made by a guy who is a veteran of the games industry, but he made music for um, like Commodore 64 games and then like all through the early 90s. He, remember was, he name? made music. I don't, unfortunately. Um, I hadn't heard of him before. But he he made a, a, apparently a bunch of very classic, very early music on like maybe even the Spectrum, like all the way back then. And then he he bowed out of games um, and he went to work on, I think, scoring films. And then he's come back and he's made this. So from what I glean from that is he missed a very large chunk of what, what the games industry yeah. has achieved in Man, that that's, time. That is definitely a weird, like subcategory <laughs> of games is the like 
person who had a career in the video game industry like two decades ago, but hasn't really constantly been around since then. And sort of you get the sense it's like, oh, people are bringing back all the classic games now. I'm going to bring back this classic thing that I know. But it's like the one that there hasn't really been a clamor for. And also <laughs> they haven't really kept up with stuff. So there's like this weird naivete, like outsider art quality to it. Yeah. Um, that, that outsider sounds... Outsider art quality is a very perfect description for this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. that sounds yeah. like what But it is. works in a way that's like, you know, it's, it's annoying to control and like navigate the menus because the buttons are the wrong goddamn button. The, you know, the cancel button is the accept, you know, that kind of thing. Right. But then that naivety is really interesting because then he's kind of coming at it with a new approach in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, so the function of this game, you're this detective. You, this is called contradiction. Contradiction, yeah. So you navigate around still images of, of a village and the, there's this weird kind of gradient over the sky to make it look otherworldly, which is why it looks oh, like those CGI backgrounds right. of the 90s, right? It has like a weird otherworldly quality to it. But you kind of navigate around until you get to a uh, to a situation where you can talk to someone and then you you can grill them on certain subjects you can only ask them questions based on like items or like things topics you've talked to other people about or things you've found so the first thing you do is you go to this house and you look at this house and there's like a bike outside so you look at that and he's like oh there's a bike and there's some like a recycling bin with some bottles in it and some other crap so now you have the knowledge of these items <laughs> they and like film a film all the different ways this guy had to root through the garbage you kind of get like still pictures of it yeah sometimes okay. it's like him just walking around like Imagine opening a, a door fun shoot for that guy oh god it's really funny um <laughs> but then you go and talk to someone and you're like you have some recycling bottles outside tell me about those <laughs> and then they're like oh yeah i i had some wine and then I put them in there, <laughs> whatever. And so some of the stuff, you know, you're, you're talking to people. The idea is that you're trying to catch people out in a contradiction and contradicting themselves. <laughs> in the, and then you can uh, take two passages of conversation that you've had with these people and put them into a box. Um, and then if there is a contradiction, they'll light up green and then that will open a new conversation. So that's, you're looking for two that's things. That's very much like said. the way you grill someone in Phoenix, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, kind of, yeah. So you're like plugging these things. You're like, hmm, you said that you went to see your parents on Thursday night, but yet you were in the pub on Friday night. Like that kind of thing. Right. But the funny thing is, like, as you're finding, you know, the story unfolds. That's kind of so what's it's... sort of like implicitly going on in her story. But there's no like, the, the point of that game is that that's just happening in your head as you sort of piece things yeah. together. But there's no like challenging it it's just okay well yeah and you're seeing in her story you only see one person's testimony right, with no this, you're questions doing the asked. yeah this you know it's multiple camera like you know you see yourself sitting down and saying things but just like an adventure game you say the same things over and over, and over, and over again so if you keep having to go talk to the same person you keep you'll keep saying all right see you later i'll probably be back for more questioning <laughs> like over and over and over again um but but it unfolds interestingly like it's kind of fun there's it's intriguing mm-hmm. i will probably go back to it and play it more because it's kind of weird but it's like hd video like it's like yeah more it's or less. really weird the acting I was looking is at the screenshots it this looks like a screenshot of a movie yeah it's filmed you know like not like a movie maybe, maybe like a soap opera or something you know, yeah well, it's it looks like a screenshot without... of, like a, of a television show or something like there's cinematography whether you're going yeah. to give it merits or not but yeah is it is it, still being filmed i mean like the well, acting well, well, isn't how, what is your point here like we... i would just it doesn't look like um it doesn't have that sort of computer degradation of fmv that okay you just mean it's brain. just high because it's higher resolution and it's just yeah, it's but just I mean, generally it's like what the old games would have wanted to look like yeah it's just like actual sure, okay. sets actual places they're probably like slightly um photoshopped yeah but we, that that is a fair point though because when you think of when i think of fmv games i think of like old like Cinepack quick time compression or something exactly and then, right and then her story is a really modern fmv game but they deliberately degrade all the footage to be on vhs and to be like an old digital mm-hmm. archive so it actually ends up kind of evoking the shitty lighting and like bad like you know chromatic sure. aberration of fmv stuff but yeah and the only um, time this kind like, of does that is the gradient fill still, but this is the thing like because you're right that it, from a fidelity standpoint it is more modern but it still includes shots like this 
Oh yeah, it's like, true. I'm sure like Deshaun now, which is like right. two characters saying, looking that... direct, like look, facing right into the camera. One of them with like the most overacted expression, right. so it's very clear. It like, looks like what his room. emotion is. It looks like yeah. the room. Yeah, like, yeah. Be, like, which is a movie. Yeah, that's yeah. all yeah. My, my point. Any, is. You... Anyone still captured from video in contradiction could be a behind the scenes set photo from the production of a '90s FMV game. Yeah. Exactly. You, know what's, you know what's really funny about this? Actually, if you look at the screenshots. All the screenshots that are of – that only include characters that are not the main character actually look like shots from a film or a television show right. of some sort. Whereas all the ones that include the main character all look like FMV games because <laughs> at every single shot, he's like mugging in some outrageous way or like ostentatiously holding what I assume is a piece of evidence like yes. in a very obvious way. And it's he, weird. He's to such see an contrast. annoying main character. He's like <laughs> – and he's got that hat. It sounds, yeah. it sounds crazy, but like I do think there is somebody's going to make an FMV game with all the technology that exists now and the game design knowledge that exists. It's going to be really good. Well, her story is really good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I should say that that is, I don't know, I guess revolutionary or something. <laughs> I think it's going to come. Like I think when you look at stuff like. Did you ever see that stupid Taylor Swift you mean, music video? When you thing? say revolutionary, you mean similar. You you mean similar to what? Because her story, I think, is actually a genuinely good game and is oh, different. It's a great game. Is different yeah, than yeah. this style. But you mean one more like in more line like a genre defining with, sort of like oh you can make games like this now that are more like FMV games. There were a bunch, you know, uh -huh. but. You don't think like, her story suggests you could make more games like that? You think it's well, a one-off like, intrinsically? I feel like with her story, the design of her story is intrinsic to its presentation, mm -hmm. right? Like, if you were going to make another, like, if I sat down and said, ooh, I want to make a game like her story, I would sort of have to find a device for players sure. to mechanically sort through videos and have that be wound into the you mean you think, that, you think that someone is going to make, a, like, a, like, broader container for new interactive cinematic experience based on video that you can then sl right. slap a bunch of genres and a bunch of different things into as opposed to her story which is like if you made a, a her story alike mm -hmm. it would be very apparent whereas just right. like i think that's a testament to her story yeah. yeah we actually talked about this exact thing oh, on the her story spoiler cast okay and like sort of talked about ways that you might broaden out that that concept but anyway i was only bringing it up because it reminded me of that stupid taylor swift app where, oh, by the way, <laughs> the guys, I'm video. fucking mad at Taylor Swift for a lot of reasons right now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, where you can watch the music video like a voyeur almost walking from yeah, room to room. Crazy. That was good. And, like, spin 360 while holding an iPad in front of your face and see the room in 360 alive. Which is, that was, like, the cheapest version of of VR ever made is that yeah. iPad that's just a window into a world. I mean, somebody's going to make that for cool, Oculus. Somebody's going to really do a music effective. video like that for Oculus, and it's going to be an interesting effect that's going to be cool right well like yeah. apply contradiction right. to vr and maybe you're onto something like if you take that yeah like it, it's almost as if he's like oh finally the technology is here but he's just like it's slightly too early and actually the technology is about to be here in a Man, way i would be so happy more... if someone made a vr a vr mystery game that had that same shitty mugging bad acting from fmv Man, but I'm it's all shot in perfect 360 yeah. degree I'm stereoscopic vr would, i'm trying to think how you would do that like in a in a cost effective way while still having to record all of the like different because the thing that's cool about that style of like exploring a room is that it's contiguous like the thing that was so cool about the taylor swift music video app thing is that you're constantly walking through this space and at any time you're looking around and everything is all continuous you'd have to yeah there's there's probably not a cost effective way you'd probably have to do what they do what they are doing with that new uh guitar hero game Oh, where mm -hmm. they shot the entire thing on a motion control rig, so they yeah. could just do take after take mm -hmm. after take, or you could shoot your base plate like like the way that modern TV like digital set extension stuff is done, where you shoot your actors on a base plate in right. a green screen room, and then you bring the same motion control rig out to a city street or to the right. Louvre or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You gotta set it in the Louvre. Or it's gonna you be FMV. Apply it to your Maya project, right? Or you and, put yeah. yeah, exactly. Or you have your stupid Maya, your, your Maya file. It would be it expensive, but you. The technology would allow for this to exist. You could make something like, um, uh, wow, I, The Last Express now mm, yeah. like this. You could do it. It would be expensive as fuck, and yeah. you'd have to be that game was already expensive as. And fuck you'd have to be a smart time. person to like, you know, the be Last in charge Express of a game like that. But a, you could technically do it. Yeah, but if you're gonna do, if you're gonna redo The Last Express and you're gonna do it using modern technology, you should do it just in real time 3D 
and in a stupid VR headset, but just have it still be node to yeah. node. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, I'm not saying you should. <laughs> I'm just saying you technically. I'm saying could, someone could, should because I would put on would a stupid cool. VR headset to play a sweet yeah. Blast Express. You uh, could do it with that. Game would be good because you could, you get around kind of one of the part of, a thing that's tricky in with VR, which is movement, because that game really only have to move on one axis, mm-hmm. and then occasionally, like you can walk into a room, but like you're basically just walking backwards and forwards along the br- the length of a train, and then when you walk into a room, it's just a button to go into room. Um, yep. So that would be pretty button would, to go in. But I mean, you can do I it just in mean the you're, not, you're not having to like, like you can walk around stick, those spaces. You know, man, that'd be awesome. That'd be a really fun game to work on. Um, really so hard. I played also a detective game. Well, before you go into that, oh, I just sure. want to say, despite all this hamminess and despite being kind of clunky and weird, it is kind of fun. I mean, you've to go the combination down that of you memory. talking about it and just looking at a few screenshots has made me want to play it. Yeah, it's so, like it's enjoyable thing to play for, it's some, it's, for reasons it's slightly unknown. Yeah, for reasons unknown, that are not, not bulleted in the, yeah, in I the game description. I couldn't like <laughs> read back to you exactly why I want to play this game but some intangible combination of factors there's some good stuff in there that is that funny and desire. stupid and and the contradictions are sometimes just so sort of like just like oh for god's sake <laughs> <laughs> but but it's still kind of amusing and the main guy will just annoy the shit out of you but also he will you just you can grill everyone about the most tedious things like right, so everyone sort of in the village you can say do you know anything about his bike that he borrowed from his cousin and they're like i don't even know he had a cousin <laughs> like, or a no bike. why would i know about that you know or like, <laughs> do you know what about his recycling do you know anything about this guy's recycling but then some objects it's like no you don't want to talk. you know that you can't select them but why does it keep letting you select some of the more dubious things anyway i think it's worth that, checking that, out that at least the trailer for because it's kind of a weird you, experience when you first started talking about that about sort of the guy's discarded wine bottle or whatever <laughs> it, it really it made me think about how adventure games in particular pre like i guess you know 21st century i suppose definitely had this attitude that i assume stems back from the ability to just populate or the original ability like decades ago to to populate a world with interactive objects and have you like look at them and inspect them, which is just that like, if you can make something inspectable or usable, then the player should get the ca- player character should give equal weight to it as everything else in the world. And which is actually still true of a lot of games. It's just that those games, the, you, the, 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 the tool set you apply to them is like this, pick it up and drop it or whatever, instead of like write content for this character mm-hmm. to care about this useless piece of shit right but like we have to support all the things so all of these objects well, have I some think in, in old adventure game design sort of like philosophy and really old adventure game fans still see it this way and complain if you don't do it that ostensibly makes the game harder because every single targetable right. you're putting in you're inter- introducing a red herring mm-hmm but then Use I guess when you have well, there's two. Use there's blank actually there are actually Use two blank different blank. approaches. There's the Sierra approach, which is that, which is like you don't all these. They're red herrings, and there's crazy things, and everything is just there, and some of it's useful, and some of it's not, and some of it'll kill you. Then there's the then there's a LucasArts approach, which is like Chekhov's gun is paramount, and everything like w- nothing will exist unless it is integral somehow to the completion of this story always yeah but then you and they're have both very extreme you have like positions. the sam max hit the road version of that though where everything is presented as basically farcical nothing until it's not and then yeah, suddenly yeah. you just have to smash a character's head into a random collection yeah, of pixels true. on the wall to solve a stupid room yeah or in this case you record 30 different video variants of a guy in right. a dumb hat talking about them to people yeah that was one of the like criticisms that's levied against Broken Age that I read over and over again is people saying that they're really mad about it because it, there's no look at button that mm-hmm. they can't like look at all the pixels right. in the room and have witty things said about mm-hmm. them. Well, now you don't have to because you can see what it is now. <laughs> Your character, you can you can actually just look at it and you it, it's and, clear. Yeah, like what is that two by two pixel thing? Oh, it's a cake or whatever. Like you right. know, now you can see it's cake. Yeah. Use your own eyes. Um, so I played a game uh, just to continue the detective theme, the detecting theme uh, <laughs> called Fingered, which was released basically out of nowhere by um, Ed McMillan and an artist uh, who's, who's I can't remember his first name, but his last name is Id, I believe. Like and Jonathan? Something like that. And, and Jonathan Carmack Id. <laughs> <laughs> So was that a joke? Yeah, <laughs> it had the sound of a joke. Yeah, I got, it had I got, the intonation of a joke. Got him. Okay, it's James Id, Edmund, James. Edmund yeah. McMillan, and James Id. So Edmund McMillan is 
has has released a lot of games. He used to do Flash, like weird Newgrounds Flash games back in the day, Newgrounds esque Flash games back in the day. And um, would, would we know any of them? You remember? Any well, of them? things you would know would be more recent things like Binding, the Binding of Isaac. Okay, yeah. And uh, he's been working on a game called Mugenics for for a while now, and he uh, uh, Super Meat Boy. Um, anyway, he has a very particular style, which is very sort of, um, like vulgar in a, in a, in sort of the way that like underground comics of the sixties are, you know, I mean, it doesn't look like that. His art style is different than that. As I say, it's more of the sort of like the way things are just aggressively gross. Yeah. But yeah, things are very like intentionally and aggressively irreverent and kind of just like prurient in a in a particular kind of way i don't know if they're prurient they're not like arousing no yeah that's true I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, but they're like yeah they're, that's true yeah. They're, they're they're like um aren't they i'm trying to think <laughs> that's true each to their own each to their own <laughs> i'm trying to think of like the, the the word that describes what i'm trying to talk about but there's like a uh, sort of just a grossness that he sort of delights in yeah, you know, in, in, they're like there's work. a level of the grotesque that they're yeah, all in the orbit of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so this this game was released with relatively little fanfare. I had not even heard of it until it was actually just available to buy on Steam for a dollar eighty seven. And it's a, it is self. It's described officially as a hyper realistic police sim. Um, you. Uh, See, with a one? live action launch trailer, yeah, the, the, with yes. the last lines Speaking of it, of live are, action detective. Yeah, board. with the last <laughs> lines of it are, I'm not even going to tell you what this game is. <laughs> Those are the last lines that are spoken by the narrator of the live yeah. action trailer for a Boy. game that is not live action. <laughs> yes, I downloaded the game because I saw that. I don't even know if I don't think I finished watching the trailer, so I didn't even see. Oh what yeah, those are the last. But there's, words there's the a trailer. lot of live action stuff in the trailer, and I'm like, they really. Make a live action what? And I downloaded it. It's all right. sort of Ed McMillan, car, you know, Flash style cartoon animation. Um, but it's confusing because there. Uh, what's that game? Uh, the driving game that has the FMV, the interstitials that have live action interstitials oh, round, that have like echoes in it. Roundabout. Yeah, roundabout. So I don't. When I saw the trailer, I kind of got that vibe it, a yes, little bit. You know. Right. Yeah. yeah. But the Super Meat Boy had a live action trailer as well. That was sort of an old, like a video game throwback. Thing yeah, that's of, true. Of just right. like yeah. The way like a '90s Nintendo yeah. commercial would have been. Yes. So, so Sorry, anyway, that's okay. So what this game actually is, it's a very small scope game, and I, I, it, I definitely get the sense that Ed McMillan likes to he he, you know, he's obviously he spent a long time working on uh, Super Meat Boy with um, uh, Tommy Refinez, I believe, right? And uh, and that ga- the sort of like toll that that took on him was one of the subjects of the movie. Uh, indie game the movie and um he clearly likes to sort of decompress with smaller projects binding of isaac started out as one of those and became a bigger game and this is another project that he and the artist i guess put together in a very small amount of time and it's it is very small scope you you start the game and the first thing that you can do before you actually start the game is type in a name into this like police database and based it will use the name that you type as a seed to generate a criminal profile. So if you type in, you know, James Spafford, what? It'll, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll show <laughs> I'm you. I'm suing Ed McMillan. <laughs> <laughs> it'll show you the profile of this like criminal, you know, oh. this d- dossier and it'll be like, you know, Jolton James or something. And it'll be, you know, uh, convicted for, and it'll say something possibly outrageous. Like, it's you know, not true. Stealing legs off desks, and then it will say I've sentenced to, you know, heaven for one month or something. Oh, like just some weird, like most of them, just this is weird. Is it Mad Libsian in that yes, way? Yes, that that part is very Mad Libsian. Okay, and actually, the game kind of is as well in a certain sense. And, and it's like a desktop simulator, like a uh, like Papers Please or something. It seemed like sort of yeah. So but I don't so know. that that's this is just like a weird little like appetizer to the game where you can just type in as many names as you want bouche. and it will just show yeah a little muse bush and it will just show you these you know profiles and then you you and, and and along with like a cartoon you know rendering of this character with you know just in this crazy style there's like even less human looking than a typical ed mcmillan character would be these are just like grotesque weird looking people 
so you go into the game and the game is just a, it's just one after another after another uh police lineups where you're you're on the you're behind the glass in a police lineup and then the other on the other side of the glass is I don't know half a dozen or however many suspects who are all lined up of all different you know heights and physical builds and skin tones and hair and like you know uh, just distinguishing features and jewelry and all kind, just all the different things that that sort of distinguish people. And then there's a witness <laughs> who's uh, smells. Yeah, sadly not. Uh, there's there's a, a witness who has four pieces of information about you know a, a criminal that they witnessed, and they you know the when you start the game. The witnesses are all very sure of these four facts, and so they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm certain that he was tall. He was definitely thin. Um, you know, he, I, I'm certain he was rich, and uh, I can't even remember what all the things they say are. Smell but, nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and so you have to like they want it. go through the, um, you know, the lineup and see which 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 one person you know which one suspect in the lineup matches all these it's descriptions like guess who yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking in my yes friend. it's yeah. like a really fucked up guess who and then the, so and and before each of the you know the first character the first witness is like simple bob or something like that and he's just very straightforward just the things he says are just on their face classic true but bob. then as you go through it's like I think like the second or third witness is like this witness is racist, and you're like, oh god. And one of the, I mean, I don't know if these are randomly, you know, assorted or so not. So this does kind of have that the, was an audible, real, genuine gasp. Yeah, that's James how I play. Guess who? <gasps> With my friends. With well, so, your racist. Yeah. This friend is racist. No, yeah. When you're in a, when I'm in a pub and they have a copy of Guess Who, you say it a lot, and then you play a game like that. Like, is this person capable of murder? Yes. <laughs> and then you go through, like, wow. do you think they maybe are a pedophile? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> you knock it all down, and is it George? Yep. <laughs> it's really good. But yeah, one of them is that. Do you think they're a racist son of a bitch? So, <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's different. That's different. That's the opposite. Because this is like the witness. This would be is you. Oh, okay. like, this is, he's so I play it the blank. opposite way. <laughs> you're like, oh, Jesus. We got to get out of this pub now and so, never come back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the 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 witness. It'll be like this witness is racist, and the witness is like, you know, I don't like this kind of person. And you're like, and then the it's like, okay, this is makes me feel very fucked up. That based on that, I'm like pointing to the black character. You know, like it's it's that it. Some of them are just completely like innocuous and just like so in in, in the way but, that it introduces. Wouldn't that make you not then be like it's him because it's like well he only thinks it's him because he's racist. Um, the like, racist part is that he doesn't like the person for that reason. You know what I mean? This like, is a very confusing game. It's it's so you're trying to read that the person is racist. No, it tells you infer, like it tells you that he's racist. Yeah, and he says, and I didn't like him. He's like, it's a kind of person I don't like, or something like that. I oh, can't okay. remember exactly, but it's like, but it makes you feel uncomfortable to play, and not in a way that's like illuminating. It's not like making you uncomfortable because you're confronting complex. Reality. Right. It's it not uncomfortable you... the way it's like to send someone home in papers, please. You're like, oh, I feel right. bad for doing that because I think they might be a terrorist. Right. It, it feels just... very much like an Ed McMillan version of Papers, Please, though, in that way. Yes, and they just that, sort of like, I like... will poke at you, audience member, yes, player. Exactly. Except that it, through the, the through the lens of the person who wrote the opening cutscene to Binding of Isaac. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that is, that is very much what it what it what it is like to play. It is weird and like aggressive. The game is very and. Which is made all the more so because these characters, again, are so crazy looking. Like, they don't, like, for, for no particular reason other than it's just how Ed McMillan, dis or or the artist maybe, is maybe it wasn't he who did the art this time, I'm not sure. But in any case, the art in the game is just, for whatever reason, these characters are just cr very crazy looking. Not in any particular way, they're just weird. And so that already just makes the whole thing feel kind of just off and strange and then and again most of these sort of witnesses are just very like innocuous descriptions of things but then there's the racist guy and you're like this is just that's just it and then when you select a character you you have to s literally like sentence them to the electric chair like you you point at them with your finger and then and a voice goes like I'm sending you to the chair or something like that. <laughs> and then you ha and then there's a drum roll and the drum roll continues 
until you flip the like big cartoonish switch that like electrocutes them and then a newspaper headline splashes across the screen and says guilty man executed or innocent man executed depending on whether you were correct or not and that's the game and that just keeps happening you just do this forever it's fucking weird i don't really know if i recommend this game or not (laughs) it's just a weird like i it's just strange very strange i mean it's actually not that strange in concept except that it's made strange because of the like the it's execution because and, of and the, the, the aesthetic yeah. and the sort of the sensibility of the creator, which I guess is like the good reason for it to be strange. But, you know, I'm not sure what I think of the result. Yeah. A lot of people have, I mean, if you think of Binding of Isaac or Super Meat Boy, more Binding of Isaac than Super Meat Boy outside of their mechanical merits. A lot of people have that same Mm-hmm. criticism of something like binding of isaac i think it's hard to criticize binding of isaac in terms of it's like just game design because it's very strong like it's really pleasurable to mm-hmm. overcome the challenges of that game but in terms of its creative design you can sort of like be, go into conflict with it mm-hmm. because you don't know if it's supposed to mean something or if it's like passively abusive or what well, so this, is, this <laughs> yeah. is actually one of the things that I, that makes ed mcmillan's work to me, I, you know, I brought up a comparison to underground comics of the sort of 60s and 70s. And one of the reasons I think that that is uh, an appropriate comparison is because, you know, a lot of that work, when you think of someone like R. Crumb, for instance, that that vein of, of uh, alternative comics, mm-hmm. a lot of it is just like, here's my site, here's me doing a deep dive into my own psyche and putting the results on the page in a really, really raw way. Yeah. And in a, a lot of times it can be very, um, it, it can be sort of like illuminating or, or kind of, it can transcend itself. And then sometimes it's just kind of like gross and weird and like aggressive to your, you know, as the viewer, like it's, it's, you kind of can't have the good elevated version of it without, like a lot of it just being kind of an uncomfortable look into a fucked up mind. Right. Like right. You, you, because if the, if the artists were to censor themselves in like to, to sort of like limit themselves to just the sort of like um, elevated version of it, they probably wouldn't make the stuff that's actually revealing in an interesting way because they wouldn't let themselves be, constantly open enough to do it and i think probably a lot of people would disagree with what i just said and i don't think that's true of all artists and all kinds of work but i do think it is true for a particular kind of like very deep self deep diving like illuminating of neuroses and hang-ups kind of art and artist and like i don't say that to defend the full kind of repertoire you know what i mean Uh but but i do think it's an interesting vein of artistic exploration that i'm glad there is an example of in games even if i'm not sure that like this particular like version of it is necessarily the greatest thing ever Um, it feels like that's a stronger argument in terms of the this game as a part of a collection of all yes, of his games. Definitely. I think it's really interesting and to look at all of games his stuff. Mean, doesn't really behoove that though. Like you don't have, again? like video games as a, as an entire, as a, a form a form doesn't really behoove. I not even behoove, but it said. doesn't really, I answered what I said, but it's not, so I don't, but it, it's, <laughs> it's not conducive. It's to not that. conducive to that because people take authorship at such a lesser importance. I think like it's not as, I mean, I don't know. There's a certain subset of the industry that I think holds authorship well, I think it just up pretty depends. high. Well, because well, I think there are some games where authorship is like uh, completely um, un, uh, um, not in dispute at all, right? I mean, there are right. games that are just made you, by one person. And when you buy no... a comic book, it says R. Crumb's name on there all the time, yeah. and it has, you know... A certain well, like, I, cohesiveness I, across multiple that's true, efforts. But, that's true, but if you buy a Marvel comic book, unless you're someone who really cares about the writer and the artist, you're probably buying it because it says Batman, not because it says 
the artist name, right? So it kind of depends on what. Yeah, but I don't think those ga- those comics would fit into the description that you were. I think that's true, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like it depends what. Like if you're someone who pays attention to the latest completely non-promoted game by Ed McMillan, right. it's probably because you know who this guy is yeah, and you played yeah. some of his work. And same thing if you play the works of like Nina Freeman or something, who, right. by the way, was on the most recent episode of Designer Notes, a podcast on the Idle Thumbs Network. Look at that cross-network promotion. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, like if you play her, like she works for Fulbright now working on Tacoma, but she also just has all of her own smaller scale games and like those are, you know, her games. And, and I think there are, for, pe- for the sort of community of people who follow that kind of game creator, I think it's totally a totally valid, like, I think yeah. the the overall, like, you know, collection of an artist, I think is still a worthwhile thing to discuss. I think it gets complicated in games Just, also because games, in a different way than a lot of other popular media, kind of operate on two axes of the mechanics versus the creative content. And, like, there are a lot of people who are known creators in the game space whose work people follow because they make real-time strategy games that they love or uh, yeah, or I because they make adventure games that they love. Whereas Ed- Edmund McMillan, there's a thematic through line mm-hmm. that, that connects a bunch of completely disparate games mechanically. Like, or Brennan Chung is yeah, like Brennan that as Chung's well. Yeah, Brennan a good example. But I think that, I think that often creators of those types, and I'm sure this is not universally true, but I think very frequently the kind of person who makes games like that tend not to make games that exclude people who aren't like crazy devotees of a particular genre. So even though Brennan Chung has made a real time strategy game, and even though Ed McMillan has made a fairly hardcore roguelike game, I don't think either of those games are like examples of their genre where you have to be, a crazy like roguelike or strategy oh, yeah. person to get into that. Although I, I, so I think McMillan he, broke out of he totally, in, a, in a really he big totally way. did, but yeah. I think if you're just generally an Ed McMillan fan, you can you you can just sort of tag along and get enough of yeah, Binding he, of Isaac. He, just, if you're a Super Meat Boy fan and you go, ooh, a new game by the guy who made Super Meat that's Boy, true, and you buy Finger, you're gonna go, what? That's true, but that's also his least personal feeling. Like mm-hmm. that's a weird game for him because yeah. all the, all his crazy Flash games before that were so much were so like this in the mm-hmm. sense that they were these crazy. Yeah. like, here's my fucked up brain, and I'm just opening the window, and you're gonna stomp around in it. Well, uh, in that sense, it's actually pretty commendable for someone to break out and have such a like financial success like a commercial success like super meat boy and then continue to uh serve his own creative whims as opposed to he's, you know he's making clearly, super he's Bo- clearly in, making in, the sequel or whatever he's clearly increasingly savvy about this stuff though because binding of isaac then got flipped into a game that has the aesthetic polish of something like super right. meat boy right um mm-hmm. and i think he did that with gish way back in the day as well which was oh man gish i forgot about gish oh, yeah, gish was gish. like a, Early, it was like 2003. Early notable indie game, I guess, yeah. which is just a physics, mm-hmm. a platformer where you play as a blob of tar that's physically driven that can stick to walls and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that was one. That was like one of the sort of first wave of mo- I would say like modern st- version of indie games. Yeah, that and like that and N. Mm-hmm. Yep, mm-hmm. and Aquaria and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, so anyway, that that's fingered. I, you know, I obviously as you can. That's Tell, I, I guess I'm pretty like I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of ambivalent about the game, but it's you know as as with a lot of his work, it's sort of I suppose most significant in the context of like all of it. Uh, so we could do some or some, some reader man from you the readers. As a side note, I really 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 liked Nina Freeman's last game, the, which was her most recent. Game. Which one are you talking about? The I can't remember the name of it, but it's the. Uh, adventurish game where you're going out to a bar with your friend and texting mm. and waiting for your friend to show up. It is really great. Well, if you, again, if you would like to hear from Nina Freeman speak at length with, uh, Adam Saltzman, um, other noted indie developer, go to idlethumbsnet slash designer notes. Check out all of those interviews. The was easiest it, was it, thing you was could it do. freshman year? Was that yes, the game? it was okay. freshman year. The easiest thing you could do would just be go to SoundCloud and subscribe to the entire Idle Thumbs hose. That's true. At SoundCloud.com slash Idle Thumbs and never miss anything mm-hmm. from us across all shows. 
Also, since we're just doing this, well, uh, uh, one of you is looking for reader mail, the, though, right? I'm yes. just fucking filling the, uh, time. We now have our own iTunes page as well. So if you go to iTunes and search for Idle Thumbs, and you if you go to any of our shows, you can click on the Buy Idle Thumbs thing, and it will show you like it has a nicely formatted, organized list of all of our. It looks really our nice, podcasts. Chris. You did really good on that, man. Did you see <laughs> in the news that a very predictable? But also laughably amazing thing happened. That Clint Hawking left. Oh man, I know. Oh my god! Without yeah. releasing a video. I know. Game. I know. What a yeah. We the talked about that today. The online. online. So, yeah. So good and he, so That's bad. what he's now. Oh, for three post Ubisoft. Is that Lucas correct? Arts, Valve, and Amazon. 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 Yeah. Nothing since <laughs> Far Cry Two. Clint. Still. Nothing. Guy's gone seven. What seven years? That guy's to... gone the entire length of the existence of the Idle Thumbs podcast because when when Idle Thumbs episode one came out, it was ba- I think Far Cry Two was like coming out in a week or something. I mean, it was yeah. like re- Idle Thumbs is basically as old as Far Cry Two is. Um, or the podcast, anyways, is about as old as Far Cry. A podcast 2 is. as old as Far Cry Two itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and we the entire time that this podcast has existed, Clint Hawking has been bouncing from studio to studio trying to. Make a game and never and or trying to, be- to maintain a legacy of Far Cry Two. <laughs> like, being his how can song. I surf through this industry with Far Cry Two being like my last, my game. last greatest game? But I still would no. like to have a job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be a trail of just very interesting design documents and probably some prototypes and probably some games that are depressingly far along, at least in a couple of these stops. Like whatever he was doing at LucasArts has to exist in some capacity and be, and be depressing to everyone involved. Was yeah. it, uh, I don't think he was, Star Wars on, I don't numbers? think he was, I don't think he was 13, 13. Maybe he was but by, by the end, but I, I feel like he, I don't think that was his game there, but I don't know enough about it. I yeah. can't wait for his GDC talk when he's allowed to actually reveal some of this in like 20 years right. when it's all water under the bridge. <laughs> <Could I> be- <laughs> Postmortem subject me. Subject, so never shipping a game. Depressing times. Yeah, I hope he ships a game one day. Fans of Far Cry 2 need to band together and do one of those really rude Kickstarters where you just do it without <laughs> the person's permission, just like a complete asshole. Yeah, that's what needs to happen. That's probably, that's what that's what will happen. Yeah, everyone who loves Far Cry Two and uh, has money to spend on <laughs> on, on nothing on Clint Hawking on Clint Hawking. Oh. Uh, sorry, okay, this is actually another non-reader mail thing. But Jake, I know that you and I both saw a, a very distressing video today, which was Boston Dynamics <laughs> Pet yep. Man yeah. on the fucking loose. On the leash, though, because his he's leash like still is still tethered okay. by a leash. So look, let's, we, we've, uh, we've, we've talked about Boston, Dynam- Boston Dynamics is the company that birthed Robot News, I think, because yeah. of Big Dog. And then Petman is their like... Birthman has largely reared Robot yeah. News. <laughs> Petman is basically their Terminator prototype. Like, it's their humanoid that can run around and climb stuff and Punch stuff. through walls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can do whatever the <laughs> he fuck. He can survive being hit by a giant comedy ball on a chain. <laughs> yeah. And keep, his, but keep his balance. They, yeah. they put video out now of Petman just running around in the woods. <laughs> he looks like a drunk man. Yeah. Running around just like a, dr- a drunk man no who on. can just snap Arr! your neck with his, with his Petman hands. And yeah, It Pet- is so important that... We actually do pass that legislation about making sure these things don't have brains. It is so actually important. <laughs> it is so legitimately non kidding. Stop anything. Imp- yeah. It's, it, you want to know why that's not going to stop anything, Sean? A human can Here's control. Yeah, this. I know. I saw- Here's a report from CNET. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mama robot builds self evolving baby robots. Well, that's not good. Mm-mm. That's not a thing we should let anyone. Do or consider. Uh, 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 life, uh, something, something, something. Yeah. So you guys going to talk about Pet Man running through the woods? Well, no. Brought to you by the Alphabet Corporation. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. Yeah, Yeah, bad times. No, Pet Man has a a cord coming off of him, off of it, off of whatever. That's not gender. He's a man. man, He's a a man. It's true. Let's not gender something. His last, his name involves man. Yeah. Um, Petman. But the the pet, it's Petman. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Petman. Ms. Ms. Petman. Ms. <laughs> Petman. <laughs> but the thing about the thing about Ms. Petman is that that cord is literally just to send debug information back to oh, it's power. Home. I thought you said. 
Of course. Kind of that's how it starts. Oh, this is just a so debug. No, those things don't. That, he, that, can, he can if, run for miles. If that <laughs> thing is if that thing is power, then what's the point of building this robot? There has to be a power supply inside of it because there's no purpose in sen- in sending these things anywhere if it has a cable. Yeah. I just like that it looked like they were taking him for a walk. Like you would walk a dog through the yeah, woods. Yeah, but wait, hold <laughs> on. Just have him on the they end of this a- thing. We're talking about some of the most brilliant robot scientists on Earth need a cable to transmit telemetry data? It's gotta be. They don't have fucking Bluetooth? It's gotta be so that it's instantaneous. In that presentation, he calls it a power cable. Okay. Because at least okay. for some of these robots, because like Big Dog was on, was on that cable for a long time. And then they just put up Big Dog Unleashed. And then there's just footage of the Big Dog walking around the the hill outside their parking lot. So, like, those cables are eventually superfluous. The thing that makes Pet Man notable is that it's, like, a human one. Yeah, Pet Man has a head and arms and legs. I would assume that there's a lot of work into, like, all the major shit, like, navigating and locomotion and, uh, like... Yeah, then you figure out how to put the battery inside. Exactly, you do all that stuff, and then you figure out how to make it energy efficient. But it just looks—it just looks like a special effect. Like (laughs) you figure out which robot, which hinge fires the gun. We've talked about Petman a million times, but we're getting close to the point now that you can just pay a cinematographer and a lighting designer and just shoot actual Petman, and it will eclipse what a special effects animator could make a sentient cyborg look like. Mm-hmm. Like just pet man running down a trail and like hopping over shit in real life, like not in a stupid lab, but just like out somewhere that you could just right. bring your like, it wasn't shot on an iPhone. If it was shot with a, just a nice DSLR, it would just look better than more horrifying than any movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially when the the photographer accidentally captures the moment the pet man rips the cable out of his own back. Like then <laughs> <laughs> And shoves it into the photographer. And shoves it mouth. into the photographer electrocuting him. <laughs> So, so here's some here's off. some crazy information about this <laughs> this mother robot and her and her baby robots. So they they why are we doing this? No, not the, that the thing that sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. But what's the we have an opportunity to at least not like gender and recreate all the fucking stuff. Well, here, no, here I mean here this is to your point. So one of the, this is the the project lead speaking about this. One of the big questions in biology is how intelligence came about. We're using robots to explore this mystery. Mistake. <laughs> um, so, like, mistake. so they're building they're <laughs> building robots and replicating human behavior essentially to replicate the like phenomenon of human intelligence and evolution. Mm-hmm. And right, so, but once the but they can do it really fast. Like, happens, she built. She, you can't go. Oh, no, 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 no. So the the mother built her like baby robots, and then five more generations, you know, built, and then they had already like doubled her effectiveness at these tasks in five generations. Um, and so if you, you know, you can imagine like a Moore's law situation here with this, this shit. Uh, and, um, I can, Im- I think that's the wrong M's law. I think you're looking at like a <laughs> Murphy's law situation. <laughs> yeah. So the thing that's crazy about this, it says the team also found that the mother was not only able to tweak the design of the children, she was able to introduce new shapes and gait patterns. Some, the team said that a human designer would not have been able to build. So this thing is already out designing the humans that made it. Oh, so this fine. is why the law will not work because if you pass a law that says yeah, exactly. you're not allowed to create the intelligence, they but will... the robot will create yeah. another robot which has intelligence that creates another robot, and they're not. You can't sue that robot because it's a fucking robot. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, no, no human will expand, arm the yeah, robots, yeah, but so the robots will arm them. We are going to be further. alive. We are going to be alive, not for long. For the. <laughs> <laughs> for the first lawsuit of man v robot <laughs> we will be alive man v pet man for, yeah, <laughs> jay spafford v p man <laughs> oh. man v pet man yes. yeah, that's, that's actually an v all Susan sorry I, as someone who has an english degree those are all the sort of like man versus nature man versus cell <laughs> man, man versus, versus pet man, pet man. <laughs> all very classic stories <laughs> Man, robot news is the worst. It's just depressing. I don't know. I, I, kinda, I mean, it's it's the fun. Rate, it's, it's fun the, to have a laugh about. The rate and just quantity of robot news is also accelerating in in a way that <laughs> just the Moore's true. law yeah. of robot That's news. Actually, that is the crazy thing about this is that like it is sort of hilarious and probably well, we will be disastrous this... not in the way that we imagine because we just can't even imagine right. the way it'll be disastrous. But th- that there is such a huge like people send us robot news just all the time, like now. three or four times a week. Yeah, yeah, a, like, yeah, yeah so no, ro- robot news for. started with the density what? of it is so high <laughs> that I always have so many. I don't even bother like p- finding it ahead of yeah. time because I know that the that like when we get to the podcast, 
there will be so, so much to choose from that I can just choose any of it and it'll all be crazy. Yeah, initial robot news I think was just I wonder when new big dog information is going to come out. And have you guys seen quadcopters? Right. Yeah. Like that was basically right. every couple of oh my months. Gosh. That there was, was not a drone at the wedding. Either. There was a drone that was shooting the wedding that a friend of my sister's brought. I hope you mean on, on with a camera. <laughs> well, that's funny <laughs> you should say that because we were sitting there taking like a group, sh- like a group photo with this mm-hmm. drone and it took a really awesome like video and then it flew away. I'm sure the footage looks amazing. I'm sure it's really great. Over these mountains of Utah, it's going to be beautiful. Yeah. But as it's flying away, my fucking dad, this this small town gun-toting man from Wyoming just goes, they're going to put a gun on that thing, aren't they? <laughs> and I was like, he's like, you can put a gun on that, right? You can put a gun on that, Already comma, happened. right? And I was just got my iPhone out. It was like, dr- like quadcopter, handgun, pistol. Look. And he's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, it so is cool. Not the wrong, <laughs> so wrong word. Cool. Dad. Wrong, word you're looking for is silently murder someone through any window. Yeah, but you know, not silently. The approach is silent. <laughs> the really silence are the, dr- the drones right now are really loud. The phantom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. I guess, I guess they, they've, they've got the big dog B sound. <laughs> well, it's funny because we're like in the ceremony. In the ceremony, my sister thought it'd be cool if her friend just was like, "Dude, just fly the fly the drone over the ceremony and like get some amazing aerial footage of the ceremony." <laughs> it's fucking two K. It's beautiful footage, and then it's just like <laughs> I hear it, and it's far away. It's probably two hundred yards away. It's fucking way up there, and I just like. I'm standing next to the best man and the other groomsmen. I did lean over to the other groomsmen. Like it'd be a really bad time for a swarm of bees to attack. <laughs> just nobody would know. It was just. I wonder if, as quadcopters get increasingly quiet, there's going to be regulation like how you can't, uh, like to keep subway pervos from taking pictures. Cameras go, uh, or like how uh, <laughs> that's why they make that noise or cars that have the partly, fake engine yeah. noise in it because people it's can't like a privacy the... invasion oh, right, right. well that's it the cars yeah, make, cars make noise but like yeah. cars yeah. make noise or, or cameras make sound to prevent like to prevent a car yeah. from running you over or to prevent mm-hmm. your privacy from being invaded by a camera that's right. going off without your, your permission I wonder if silent drones are going to have to make bee noises so that you know that there's a <laughs> fucking thing <laughs> hanging out outside of your window creeping on you with a gun with a gun <laughs> they push so much air it was so they push so much air down to stay aloft and it was really hot in park city that people would gather on the deck and stand underneath the drone <laughs> that's what it cool, wants you to do the cool <laughs> and then it shoots yeah. you. come under my cooling breeze <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that it has a silenced pistol, despite being incredibly loud. <laughs> I want no one else. They, wow, he, he was so comfortable. He just took a little nap under there. Yeah, <laughs> look at them cooling their bellies. Um, this is okay. So, uh, how much? How much? How much this oh, is, wasn't that all reader mail? That was all robot mail. Well, there, this is just one more that I that I, I just want to add on to this conversation. So, um, Luke sent us a, a link to. This is actually two years old. This. This is a video that I, I, I haven't watched it myself, but the description of the video explains what's going on. Which is perfect for it's a recording of a format. It, well, I mean, yeah, it's fine. The the um, it's a recording apparently of a phone call between a uh, a time, someone who just happened to be Time Washington bureau chief and a, a telemarketer. So this this journalist from Time just like happened to get. A, a telemarketing call from an ins- a, a health insurance company, and he he was offered a deal on health insurance from this woman on the phone, but he thought there was like something weird about the call, so he he started to realize at a certain point like I think this is a robot, so he asked point blank, "Are you a robot?" <laughs> and she she just like laughed and said. Uh, just like laughed and said enthusiastically, no, I'm real. And like, just, just like, ha ha ha. No, of course not. Uh, but then he just started asking her like weird questions that a health insurance telemarketer might not know, such as what vegetable is found in tomato soup. And she said she didn't understand the question. Oh shit! <laughs> so, and she, when, when he asked her what day of the week it was yesterday, she complained of a bad connection. Like she, like she was programmed to try and deflect questions 
that would indicate she is that would like help prove she's not a robot and Man. to lie and to lie to point blank basically yes holy fuck yeah so then he like told other time reporters and over the next hour they started like they all just started calling this robot to like just find trying to figure out what the fuck is going on uh so her name she claimed her name was samantha west and like and her so whole, like, her role, her, I mean, apparently a very convincing voice. And her, <laughs> it wasn't her, just Jake's yeah. bad, whatever, her, <laughs> the Mac and talk. Yeah. Like the, the point of the robot was to like get a bunch of health insurance questions out of you. Like she would ask, are you on Medicare and stuff? And then like when it was finally time to like close the sale, you'd be transferred to a real human. But it was her. She was basically like the human is the closer, but she was like, you know, the primer, the primer. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> like. <laughs> Good cop, bad cop. The number is the, I don't <laughs> real know, cop, real fake cop. cop. Fake. <laughs> I don't know if the number is. I don't know if the number is still active, but the number is four eight four five eight nine five six one one. And if you Google the number, there are just like threads full of people confused about this like weird woman who keeps calling them again and again, trying to sell them health insurance and like trying to figure out what the deal with it is. Um, it's how Skynet begins. A friendly sounding woman on the phone claimed I requested health insurance information, wrote one user. She doggedly refused to deviate from her script. So there are lots of people who just had no idea they were talking to a robot and thought they were just talking to a very persistent telemarketer, like just a low level call center employee. Um, and then. God, I bet that happens all the time when you call up. This is you you repair, you repair, mo- most of the shit that makes human, me so sad for grandmas. Human, human, grandmas can't figure this shit out. Man. Human employees of the company, when asked about when asked about uh, about the robot Samantha, just ended the call. They just like hung up. Um, the time reporter eventually called back enough to finally talk to someone who didn't actually hang up when he asked about the robot. Um, and uh, like, apparently, it's a company called PremierHealthAgency.com whose motto on their website is we're here to help dot 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 because we care uh and the company still claims that they don't use robot callers it's who and then hung up the phone like it's a it's really fucked up it's like seems very everyone involved is in fact a robot maybe it's yeah it's robots all the way down maybe this maybe samantha is just a reflection of their personalities on the phone it's like their sense of phone etiquette (laughs) it's like do you use a robot uh, uh, it's bre- we're breaking up. Call's breaking up. It's not a robot. <laughs> Technically, <laughs> it's an AI. <laughs> it's a pervasive AI that has taken yeah. over every it's, phone terminal in this company. It's yeah. a human being. Yeah. We, we can't get out. <laughs> we can't get out. <laughs> every time someone says that it's a robot, she kills them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the trigger. Call is terminated when I ask about the robot. I don't know yeah. why. <laughs> anyway. Uh, this the building is powered yeah, by an incinerator. Yeah, yeah. Right in the incinerator, yeah. <laughs> She's been just like the pulsing dark heart of this. Like, they use this obscure this old <laughs> email sorting system. system. S A M A N T H A. She's the Shodan of yeah, it's this the, fucking bad insurance company. <laughs> <shitty> insurance company. <laughs> Nobody's left that building in four years. Where's that uh, shock series spiritual successor that's just the story of this insurance company? Just greenlit right then. It's fine. Clint Hawking, get on it. <laughs> what? It'd be good. It would be good. You guys should hire him. Love nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, guys want to... Well, here's here's one email to close it out. This oh, is, we do have an email is, to close it out. This is for Jake. You're the so, closer. <gasps> so you're a real human. Jarrett... <laughs> <laughs> Jarrett Civelli, or possibly Civelli, writes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chris. No worries. Uh, Jarrett writes, "Hi, thumbs. Hearing the James Cameron story on last week's show got me thinking about an experience I had back in 2009. I was dating a woman whose family lived in L.A., and I was invited to visit while she was home over winter break, as she was still in college at the time. My girlfriend at the time liked to sleep in, so it was fairly normal for me to either spend my time alone in the guest room waiting for her to wake up. Although on this occasion, I decided to go to the kitchen where her mother and an elderly gentleman were talking. I joined them and made small talk." During their conversation, they occasionally touched upon popular things that seemed extremely familiar, but in an odd, extremely personal way I couldn't quite put my finger on. They started talking. They were robots. (laughs) (laughs) They They didn't seem to know what day it was. (laughs) She couldn't couldn't tell me what was in my tomato tomato soup. (laughs) So they started talking to me about my life and what I'd been doing, and I replied I'd been recently laid off from EA as a compliance analyst. The elderly gentleman said something along the lines of, oh, my son Steven worked with them. I asked what game he'd worked on, and he said he helped to design a game called Boom Blocks. 
At this point, a little ball, ball inside <laughs> my head started ringing, and I asked, Spielberg? It turns out that my girlfriend's family were friends with the Spielbergs, and her mother had made numerous art pieces for them. I was having with, having breakfast with Steven Spielberg's father. He was a very nice elderly man. Love the show, blah, 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 et cetera. Jared. Spielberg? <laughs> That's an amazing... <laughs> my son made a game with them. Boom blocks. Yeah. My, my son, son Steven. Steven Spielberg <laughs> made a game with them. Also E.T. <laughs> <laughs> my son. Also, also Jaws. Also Jurassic Park. The game yeah. and the game and the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my son Steven is involved in lots of video games. The E.T. game. I like that that's the thing he brought up to name drop his son to, into well, the he's conversation. Talking EA. He's talking about getting yeah. fired from EA. Because like, oh, he could bring up any topic and he could be like, oh, my son made a film about that. <laughs> yeah, like it's dinosaurs really hard, yeah. or fucking aliens. <laughs> that old <laughs> like man anything. sits there and just waits for literally any, any noun to be yeah. said. And then he's he just like, says, oh. My son made the film about that. Yeah. <laughs> right, like yeah. the best one. <laughs> Robots, AIs. God forbid the guy's like, I'm a marine uh, biologist. And he's just like, Archaeologist. <laughs> yeah, archaeologist. Anything. Any job. Any, any college professor. <laughs> Israeli assassin. Stroke. Archaeologist. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this time with Tom Hanks got stuck in an airport for like six months. Oh, my son. Yeah. He I was been... just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, God, no. It's a great flight. Great flight. I just, uh, Oof, I was just I was stuck in uh, Denver airport for like four hours. My son made a ma- movie about a man stuck in an airport. <laughs> <laughs> just anything. For much longer than that. <laughs> oh, really? Doing? My son Stevie <laughs> shot a little picture in an airport. Shot a little picture. With his friend Thomas. <laughs> home, home movies. Oh, that's a nice story, though. Meeting Spielberg's dad yeah. of the breakfast. Yep. I wonder what he ate. Tomato soup. <laughs> but what was in it? Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly don't. That's the twist, is that it's been seven years yeah. of robot then, then podcast. Then you have to do like a robot, robot processing on our voice right. and like yeah. a bad, like weird robot takeover <laughs> outro tune. <laughs> These these we shitty robots these. were trained to laugh at their own jokes and tell the same stories over and over again. They eventually ran out of material and didn't notice. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to listen to podcasts that aren't by us, but are still weirdly hosted by us, you can go to idlethumbs.net and find a bunch of podcasts that we host on our network, uh, including Designer Notes, which I mentioned earlier, which is Conversations with interesting game developers. Also, our newest podcast, I'm so excited about it. It's called Esports Today. It's hosted by Rob Zachney of Three Moves Ahead, as well as Andrew Gruen. They're both uh, professional writers about uh, professional competitive gaming. And they last week covered the International Five, the big Dota 2 tournament, which was really uh, uh, a good, really, Sean was on that, actually. And I um, was. Yes, this week they they talked about some recent, like, Post international drama, as w- as well as some uh, Counter Strike Go stuff. It's really good if you are sort of interested in esports. I mean, it's well, it's good. good if a you... passing interest in esports, yeah. it's a great hook into what's yes, going on. Exactly. I would imagine it's also like good if tweet. you know a lot about esports because mm-hmm. those guys really know what they're talking about. You can tell. But even if you're even if you're you're only more cursorily interested, it's a great listen. You can find it at esports.today or at idlethumbs.net with all our other shows. I've noticed that on the forum thread for each week's episode, uh, they've also started posting the lists of uh, any major matches mm-hmm. in the different games that they cover. So it's also a good sort of just top line look at what's going on mm-hmm. this week in esports on the forums. It's really nice. Yep. And they choose about, it seems like about three topics each week. But their overall coverage includes, you know, StarCraft, Dota, League of Legends, Counter-Strike Go. Um, I know they're planning on sort of eventually getting some fighting game stuff in there, although, you know, they missed Evo. So that's uh, it might, might be a little longer, but they're, they're trying to cast a pretty wide net in terms of the, the games that they cover. Um, and it's just very well produced. They're really, really engaging. It's a great podcast. Esports Today. And that's our show. If you have questions for us, you can email questions at idlethumbs.net. Or robot news, of course. Yeah, if, if you have anything about robots or not about robots, also is fine. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. <laughs>